their protection in the social sciences. Um, please note um, that this workshop will be recorded, um, but we will only publish the presentation parts of uh, the recording. So we will record the whole session, but then we will, dis, uh, we will just dis delete and cut the discussion parts. And if the questions from the discussions are potentially interesting to others, then we will publish this discussion in a written form, but without any names or identifiers. This is a AUSTA CESTA activity, and I will give you a little bit more information on that later on. So before we start with uh, the content, just a couple of housekeeping rules to make this a smooth workshop. So please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, please turn off your camera during the presentations, again with the hint that uh, the presentations part uh, will be published. So if you turn on your cameras, then this will be published as well. Uh, you can post your questions in the chat and then raise also your hand using the raise your hand function in the Zoom. Uh, there's this reactions button that you can use. And if you need any help at all during the presentations or during the discussion, just please write in the chat. We have a colleague with us, Veronica, who will monitor the chat and then try and help you if you need any assistance. Afterwards, uh, please tell us how we did. Uh, so we need to do a little evaluation, uh, but there will be more information on that later on. All the materials that we will show you today will be shared with you afterwards, um, including the presentation, so there's no need to write anything down at this point. Oops, sorry, went too far. So just a short introduction about us and about AUSTA, our organization. So AUSTA is the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. Um, it is a consortium of the universities of Vienna, Graz, Linz, and with our newest member, the University of Innsbruck as well. Our mission is to make social science data fair. Uh, fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this is a term that you will hear a lot in research data management and also in funding regulations. So you will also hear a little bit more about fair later on from uh, my colleague Anita. AUSTA archives research data and makes research data available. So this is our uh, main goal. And in order to facilitate the reuse of data. Uh, just in general, all the services that we have are open to all researchers, so it, this is independent of your affiliation. This means that it, your institution does not have to be a member of the AUSTA consortium for you to use our services. We are part of CESTA, um, and CESTA is short for the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives, uh, CESTA ERIC. And ERIC, again, is short for European Research Infrastructure Consortium, um, which is a European umbrella organization for all the social science data archives uh, in Europe. And uh, we have the aim of promoting the results of social science research data and uh, of supporting national and international uh, research infrastructure. And this is a joint approach to research data management in the social sciences. Who we are today. So uh, I have with me my colleagues uh, Anita and Veronica, uh, who are responsible for data curation at AUSTA, and um, I am responsible for first consultations, any basic questions on research data management, and more specific on data protection and licenses and contracts. If you want to deposit data with us at AUSTA, then you can come to me. And now some information of what we have planned for you today. So the first couple of minutes are uh, welcome and introduction and the agenda. Then we will start with a section on data management plans. So Anita will present uh, this and guide you through all the relevant aspects of uh, the DMP and how to fill out a DMP. Afterwards, there's a session on uh, data protection in the social sciences. So this will be my part of the presentation about uh, legal basics about GDPR and every aspect that is relevant for research data management regarding uh, data protection. We have included a short coffee break um, and afterwards there's this more practical and hands-on session about uh, pseudonymizing strategies that we use at AUSTA and data code for pseudonymizing their data. And then we aim at finishing latest at uh, 12.30. Okay, that's all from my side at the moment, and now I will hand over to Anita for the first section on data management plans. Thanks. 
So good morning also from my side. So um, what I will talk about today are data management plans in the social sciences. So the document that is uh, one very helpful document and the document uh, on which this uh, presentation is based is the data management expert guide provided by Cesta Eric. Here you can find a comprehensive and detailed guide lined through all the steps of DMPs and you can also find the extensive guide with many different with many different features on the website and you can also find the PDF version on this link here of provided via Synodo. So this is a, a starting point of the presentation I will give you today. What we will talk about in this part are research data management in general, as a research data management in general, and FAIR data and what does FAIR mean, and data management plans more specifically. So their purpose and their content, and their content mainly following the FAIR criteria. So to start with, what is research data management or RDM? So research data management refers to how you handle, organize and structure your research data throughout the research data process. That's at least the definition that is given in the data management expert guide by SESTA. What does this mean? This means that research data management concerns all steps of the research cycle, starting even before you start your project by thinking about which data do you need to answer your research questions, which data will you collect, which data will you gather, how you handle this data once you have collected it, and how you manage this data, for example, including backup strategies, and also later on, what will happen to this data once your project is finished? Do you archive the data? Do you delete the data? What happens to the data in general? FAIR data or the FAIR principles is an aspect that uh, will guide us through this presentation and is a very essential aspect of research data management in general. So FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So what does this mean? Findable means that research data should be findable. For example, they should be assigned persistent identifiers. They should be enriched with metadata so that uh, they can be found by repositories. They should be described using standardized vocabularies. They should be registered in a searchable catalog, for example. Research data should be accessible. So the access options under which you can access the data should be outlined clearly and transparent. There could be an AI and authentication and authorization infrastructure in place, which means that ideally you do not have to create one account for each repository, but ideally you can log in with your institutional account in a repository. Research data should overall be as open as possible, but as close as necessary. This is also a sentence that we will encounter today multiple times. Research data should be interoperable. This means that they should be interoperable or allow for interoperability with other data, tools and systems, for example, either through APIs or by manually merging different kinds of data. Essential in this respect are a proper documentation, or the availability in different file formats. And the last aspect of your data concerns the reusability of data. So there should be clear reuse regulations in place, for example, clear licenses and a comprehensive uh, documentation material so that users who would like to reuse the data know what they can use the data for, how they were collected and under which conditions they are allowed to use the data. So let's come to data management plans or DMPs. So what do they contain? Data management plans contain essentially all relevant aspects of research data management and they are a formal document, which means that you have indeed a Word document or a PDF file with the title data management plan. They are a living document. This means that 
they can and should be updated throughout the life cycle of a project. Different funding, different funders have different regulations, how often data management plans should or have to be updated. For example, one good time period or for time point to update your TMP is when you start collecting new data or if when do new team members join your project. DMPs are mandatory deliverables for many grants. So the funding regulations differ, but for many funding organizations, DMPs are mandatory. Data management plans can vary in their content depending on your research data and your requirements by your funders. And many funders also provide templates so they can look very differently, but there are some guiding points that we will cover today that should be part of most DMPs. Why go through all the troubles? So what are the benefits of a DMP? First of all, a DMP provides a plan for the future. So the idea is that you start planning all your research process before you actually start collecting your data. So you can think about all the steps of data management before you actually do them. And you can think about problems or you will be aware of problems that you may encounter during the research process and you can counteract on them. So you can get ahead of problems. For example, a problem we frequently encounter are constant forms. So constant forms sometimes contain information that makes archiving the data very difficult. So if you think about archiving the data before you start your research project, you can already draft the constant form in a way that will facilitate this process for you. And of course, good research data management facilitates the documentation, publication and reuse of data. So if you have thought all the steps through once, it's far easier for you than to follow these individual steps. Another benefit of DMPs is that they can offer guidance throughout the project. So you have one document that covers ideally all the questions concerning research data management that you may have. You can use it as a directory or as a guidance from directories. You can use it for laying out file naming conventions, for laying out versioning, for laying out backup strategies in your project. This is especially important if you're, you work in a larger team so that you set up these rules basically like a code book before you start actually going into the field and collecting data and managing your data. DMPs can also contain administrative information like grant numbers, the names of team members and the contact detail of team members. And they can also contain references to further documentation material like research log, methods, reports, and so on. So they can contain all kinds of practical information. DMPs are also very useful to plan your budget. So research data management is not free. It has a price, both in terms of money and in terms of staff. For example, storing data may be costly. There are many repositories who archive data for free, but if you pursue a different approach, you may need funding for that. So a DMB is a good starting point for thinking about your the budget you need for research data management. What are the benefits of a DMB in terms of the fairness of your data? So again, you can use it as a guideline throughout the project. Uh, you can think from the beginning which repositories you would like to use for publications. You can reach out to this repository in advance. You can think about the different data formats you would like to publish your data. You can think about licenses you would like to use for your data. So all, <clears throat> sorry, all these steps help you make your data as fair as possible. And last but not least, DMPs demonstrate that you are committed to research data management and to sustainable data handling, which comes, becomes increasingly important and is valued by many different funding organizations.
So you do not need to start from scratch when you design research data management plans. There are collections of templates and one of the most important that I've already highlighted at the beginning is that that's the expert management guide. Here we find a comprehensive document that can guide you through all the steps of research data management. And you find also here the link with the checklist, which is a more condensed version and highlights specific questions that Ash, you should cover in your TMP. The European Commission provides a template for Horizon 2020 project and also an updated version for Horizon Europe projects. There's also a template provided by the Austrian Science Fund and by Science Europe. Then you can also find collections of TMPs online, for example, by the Digital Curation Center, TCC, and by FEDRE. However, we need you need to be aware that in these collections, authors of DMPs can always publish their DMPs and there is no guarantee about the quality. So these are collections without a review process. There is even a data horror escape room for DMPs if you would like to use this approach. So let's start with uh, one example, the Horizon 2020 template. In the Horizon 2020 template, uh, the DMP is structured in uh, six chapters, a data summary, a description of fair data, a chapter on allocation of resources, a chapter on data security, a chapter on ethical aspects, and on so-called other issues. We will use this structure to discuss the content of a DMP mainly in this presentation. I will also refer to the new uh, Horizon Europe template uh, if it deviates through uh, from the Horizon 2020 template. A second example is that as the data management expert guide. And here in this document, you do not only find the questions that you should answer in the DMP, but also some answers, some responses or material with which you can find the answers to the questions raised by a DMP. So let's jump right in. What should be the content of a DMP? So first of all, it's recommended to start with some administration information, some administrative information, like the title of the project, the authors of the DMP, who is responsible for the DMP and for updating the DMP, the date and the version of the DMP, the description of the project, start and end date of the project, PIs, contact details of PIs, funding and grant numbers, and so on and so forth, and also who actually owns the data. This is a question that Lisa will address later on in her presentation on legal aspects of the data. And it's not usually not straightforward to find an answer to this question. So the first chapter is dedicated to the description of your research data. Here, the Horizon 2020 template raises a list of questions like, what is the purpose of the data collection generation and its relation to the objectives of the project? What types and formats of data will you collect? Will you reuse any existing data and how? And so on and so forth. In the Horizon Europe template, there is a stronger emphasis on whether you reuse data and a stronger emphasis on if data exists, why don't you reuse it? So this is a, fo a stronger focus on the Horizon Europe template. How can you describe your research data? The data management expert guys give several examples how you can describe your research data. The first criteria is, of course, the type of data. Um, here you find a link to the DDI control to vocabulary for the kind of data where you can describe your data, for example, as numeric, as text, as video, audio recording, and so on and so forth. Concerning data formats, one important distinction is between proprietary and non-proprietary formats. So whether the format of a file is connected to a specific software like Data or SPSS, or whether it's open for reuse like a CSV file. 
size and complexity can be reduced to distinguish data as well as the research phase. So you can describe your research data throughout the whole research process, starting from the raw data to the curated data and then to the published version of your data. Data can contain personal data or even sensitive personal data. This aspect will be covered in Lisa's part on data protection and legal aspects. And of course, then there's the possibility to distinguish between quantitative data and qualitative data. So let's come to the FAIR criteria, which are the main chapter of the DMP template provided by the Horizon Europe Europe project. So the findability of data is the first criteria of FAIR data. And the Horizon 2020 template already states making data findable, including provisions for metadata as a guideline for this chapter. We will talk about several aspects of findability of data, including persistent and unique identifiers, naming conventions, keywords, version control, and metadata standards. In the Horizon Europe template, there is again a strong emphasis on a certain aspects, and in this case on interoperability of metadata. This may seem like many demands for you as data producers, but our, our advice is to take advantage of repositories because they cover most aspects for you. So let's start with uh, this approach with repositories. How do you choose a repository? The data management expert guide and open air recommend a four step process of choosing your repository. So the first or the first choice should be a discipline specific repository, ideally a trusted discipline specific repository, which means that this repository should have a certificate, for example, like the core trust seal, which guarantees that it is sustainable and it fulfills certain criteria and has been reviewed in the community. A second choice should be your, institu your institution's repositories. So many universities provide repositories for the researchers in which they can archive the data. A third repository to publish your data should be or could be a catch-all free repositories like Synodo in Geneva, where you can deposit your data free of charge. The Harvard Dataverse would also be and repository of this category. And if none of these choices are a good choice for you or a good option for you, you could use databases for finding a repositories like P3 data or in Oster the Forschungsinfrastruktur database provided by the Ministry for Science and Education. However, for P3 data, please note that this is an opt-in list of repositories. So there is no review process in place and everyone who offers a repositories or everyone who aims at hosting data can register him or herself in this registry. So you need to evaluate the repository on your own. Persistent identifiers are important aspect of findability of data. One way or one persistent identifier that is frequently used are DOIs, digital object identifiers. This is also used by Auster. There are also other persistent identifiers like ORN or HANDLE. Naming conventions are also an aspect of findability of data. Naming conventions can concern data files, but they can also concern variable names and variable labels, especially if you connect your data to other research data, for example, in panel data. Version control is also an important aspect. Uh, you can use the name of the version, like version 1.0, version 1.1, and or the date in the file name. And was also an important aspect about version control is that uh, 
the changes from version to versions are documented, for example, in a version control table or in a research log. And important aspects that should be documented are who edited it, which version, when, and why. Repositories often support you in the steps, so they may manage version control for your research data once they are published. Which metadata are another important aspect of the findability of data. So to start with, what does metadata actually mean? Metadata are data that describe your data. So they are all aspects like keywords, topics, kind of data, data sources, the collection mode, whether you used a survey or you used a content analysis, the time on method, the unit of analysis, and so on and so forth. Here you find a link to one example from the Austro Dataverse where you can scroll through the metadata and see what kind of metadata can be used to describe your research data. Then the Horizon 2020 project also raises the questions on metadata standards. Here our recommendation is to simply reach out to your repository and ask them what, what metadata standards they use. So in case you would like to deposit your data with OSTA, here are some information that you can include in your DMB. So first of all, um, OSTA is certified with the core trust seal, so it fulfills this criteria of being a trusted or certified repository. OSTA is harvested by the Tester Data Catalog, so your research data is not only visible by or for the Austrian community in the OSTA data catalog, but also by the European community. OSTA provides DUIs for your research data, and DUIs can also be assigned before you actually publish the data. As soon as you sign a contract, a DUI can be reserved for you and you can share this DUI. OSTA takes care of naming conventions of file once they are published in the OSTA Dataverse. OSTA checks your metadata and gives feedback on your data and your metadata. We support you during all updates that you may have for your research data. So we manage the version control for you and we support you through all the documentation steps from version to version. Data will Dataverse also offers the feature that automatically all changes from version to version are recorded and thus are transparent. For metadata standards, we use DDI and SESTA metadata standards. We can give you more information on this if you're interested. And you can also look up more information on the metadata we use for describing research data using this link. Let's come to the second aspect of uh, fair data and the accessibility of data. So here are the main questions you should ask yourself is which kind of data or which research data will you share and which research data will you not share. Reasons for not sharing data could be data protection regulations, cooperations with third parties like commercial enterprises and intellectual property, property rights. In the social sciences, the first aspects, data protections are the most common and Lisa will talk about these aspects in her pre presentation later on. So the important thing is that you discuss the reasons in your DMP, because many funders expect you to make your research data available in uh, under certain criteria. They do not usually expect you to publish your data open access, but you should, but they expect you to lay out the reasons why you share your data or why, especially why you not share your data, why you intend to not share your data. In the Horizon Europe template, the emphasis is much more on repositories than on in the Horizon 2020 template. So the Horizon Europe template already asks 
Will the data be deposited in a trusted repositories? Have you explored appropriate arrangement with this repositories? And so on and so forth. So here, the focus shifts much more or the perspective of the funding agency shifted more in the directions of encouraging researchers of using repositories because they facilitate this step of making data accessible. One way of describing the accessibility of your data, and one important aspect is the software you use for your data. So one aspect you can describe in your DMB is which software is necessary to access the data. And if possible, funders also ask you to publish the code for accessing the data along with the data. They ask you sometimes even to publish the software along with the data, uh, which is of course not possible if you use data formats like SPSS or Stata. But if you publish your data, for example, in a CSV format, you can provide the syntax or the code for reading in the CSV files to Stata or R. Access conditions are another important aspect of fair data. So depending on your kind of research data, data protection often requires access rest restrictions. So data do not have to be open access to be fair. This is a very important aspect. Research data can be fair without being available open access. The important thing is that the access conditions are laid out transparent and clearly for whoever is interested in reusing this data. Lisa will give you more information on this aspect in the next part of the workshop on data protection and legal aspects. The Horizon Europe template also stresses the accessibility of metadata. What does this mean? Uh, accessibility of metadata means that metadata should be published as CC0, which means that they uh, can be harvested by other um, by other repositories, for example, that uh, metadata do not have uh, that they are available in uh, the public domain. So everyone can reuse metadata. Uh, metadata should contain access information and information on whether the data is long term available and findable even after the research data themselves may not be available anymore. And metadata should contain information about software that is necessary to access the data. The third aspect of fair data is the interoperability of data. So in this, uh, regarding the interoperability of data, data formats are a very important aspect. Here the questions are, for example, which data formats do you use for publishing your data and why? So responses you could use in your DMB are that you publish your research data, for example, as SPSS or as data files, because they, these are the formats most common in social sciences, or you could uh, follow the argumentation that you publish research data in a CSV or R format because these formats are open source and non-proprietary. By the way, Oster publishes all research data in the formats readable by SPSS and Stata and a CSV file. And the Oster stuff will do this conversion for you. So you only have to hand in the re your research data in one format and the stuff will then make the conversion to other, other data formats. Interoperability also concerns data. So in this section, this is the place to outline if you use any standardized codes in your data like ISCAD category, ISCO categories or NATS codes. And um, it's the place to highlight if you your research relates to other research. For example, if you use an established coding scheme, for example, like CMP codes from the manifesto projects. I'm sorry, I needed to chime in. Just a reminder, 10 more minutes. Thank you. 
So standardized or controlled vocabularies are another important aspect for interoperability. What does this mean? Um, standardized or controlled vocabularies uh, mean that uh, metadata are structured in a specific way so you can think about metadata or about controlled vocabularies of metadata as codes that you can use for, for your metadata so this facilitates describing metadata and matching the metadata of your research data with other research data so that you always use comparable keywords for example Controlled vocabulary that is used by Auster are, for example, the European Language so Social Science Authorities, it's as a topic classification or controlled vocabulary provided by the Data Documentation Initiative. The fourth aspect is the reusability of data. Here, licenses are a very important aspect and will be covered in the next part of the workshop by Lisa on the, along with data protection and legal aspects. What is also important about the reusability of data is the time of publication. So when do you publish your research data? Our recommendation is that you reach out the research data as early as possible to make sure that uh, you can keep up your schedule and your timeline. Here's also the place to lay out whether you plan to use an embargo and why. I, if you would like to use an embargo on your research data, please check with your funder for regulations in this regard, and please check with your repository if this service is provided. Availability of your data is the next important aspect. So do you plan a time limit with regarding the availability of your data and why? So do you plan to take your data offline after a certain time period and for what reasons and which measures do you take to make your data re reusable for a longer time period which is the default option that is preferred by many funders so measures could be the publication of your research data in a repository or the publication of your data in a format that is frequently used for long-term preservation like csv files or the bdfa files which can be used for a long time period and do not rely on newer software versions as much as data and SPSS files, for example, do. Quality of data is another important aspect. So here you can describe all measures you take for ensure your data quality, for example, all rules you have in place regarding data gathering and all, all measures you take for sanity checks of your data, for example, for checking the plausibility of your, the range of values in your data or of your observations. Documentation material is another important aspect, especially in the Horizon Europe template. The more documentation, the higher is the reuse potential because uh, people interested, researchers interested in reusing your data have more information available how they can reuse your data. We will talk more about the documentation material in the third part of the project on the OSTA deposit guidelines. Allocation of resources is the third chapter of the DMP Horizon 2020 template. Here it is important that you think about the budget that is on the resources that are necessary for research data management. So questions you likely will want to answer is who will be in charge of research data management? How many resources do you allocate for research data management? And you need to be aware that repositories support depositors in many ways, but depositors must prepare the data prepare the documentation material, handle all administrative and legal questions, and be available during the data curation process, and incorporate all changes or the changes recommended by the repositories. So all these steps require time and resources, and it's usually a good, a good um, it's usually good to think ahead about these individual steps before 
long before the end of the projects or the data publication process starts. Many repositories publish data free of charge, but if you do choose to host your own data, you should consider this cost related to hosting your own data and also what will happen to your data what after the project, who will then be responsible for hosting the data and what will happen to the storing place, for example, and for handling access requests. Data security is another aspect of the DMP. Here you can address backup strategies that is that you use to in order to secure your research data and measures you undertake to secure storage, for example, that uh, data are only accessible via computers at your organizations, that you use passwords or password protected devices, or that you use encrypted devices and folders. Data security is also important regarding exchanging data and also after the publication of data. So here our recommendation is again to use the services of repositories that will take this data security issues out of your hand once the data are published. The fifth chapter in the DMB is dedicated to ethical aspects. Here Lisa will talk will cover this in the next part of this workshop. Other research outputs are stressed in the rest in Europe template. So here the fo focus goes more in the direction of um, research output that are not classical research data, but other material that may be for interest for others, for example, software codes, workflows, protocol, and so on and so forth. And the Horizon Europe template also asks you to make this kind of material available. So um, I've reached the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thank you very much. Just a quick second for me to share my screen again. Okay. I hope you see my screen and then I will continue with uh, the next part of the workshop, which focuses on uh, data protection in the social sciences and especially what kind of data protection challenges there are when you want to do research data management. And then we want to give you some suggestions on how you can actually manage your data while all the while being uh, legally compliant and not having any data protection violations. So this is my agenda for this section of the workshop. So I want to start with a couple of legal basics just for everyone to be on the same page. What is uh, personal data, for example? What is sensitive data? What is uh, pseudonymized data? These are all aspects that you need to understand because you probably deal with personal data um, on a daily basis. Then I want to focus a little bit more on this uh, kind of discrepancy between open data and data protection. So there are a lot of different requirements coming from different sides. So for example, from funding bodies or from your institutions. Um, or also from the community, but then at the same time, um, you have data protection regulations in place that you need to follow, of course. So how can this fit together and how can you deal with that? The next part is about making data sharing possible. So by then we have heard all necessary or a lot of necessary information on, on what to look for uh, when handling data, uh, personal data and uh, what challenges there are in data protection, but then still how can we make data sharing possible, even though we have all these kind of uh, restrictions from, from data protection. The fourth uh, section is on the DNP again. So there I would like to pick up all uh, typical questions uh, that arise when you need to fill out a DNP that concern data protection or any other uh, legal related issues and try and give some answers um, for you to be able to fill these parts out as well. And then the last part is a very short part just on uh, some extra suggestions that we have on how you can more easily manage your data um, with regard to data protection. 
So let's start with the first section, which is the legal basics and their challenges. I'm sure that a lot of those aspects you've, couple, you've probably already heard of, but I'm still going to repeat the most uh, basic concepts um, because they're just uh, important and it's important to also not only understand what personal data is, but also to differentiate uh, between, as you see on this slide, for example, personal data or um, pseudonymous data, which is still personal data, and then anonymous data, which is not personal data anymore, which means that the GDPR doesn't apply. But since social science data is very often personal data, it means that the GDPR, a GDPR does apply, and um, that it's mostly, um, or it's, it's often data, let's say, about uh, people's situations, people's lives, people's opinions, and if all these uh, information that you have about people then actually leads to one individual, then this is personal data. And you have the definition um, of the GDPR here on the slide, where it says that personal data means any information relating to an identified or an identifiable natural person, which here is called uh, the data subject. And then there's a very important differentiation here between um, directly or indirectly. So it, it, it matters if a person can be identified directly, which means by just one information. So you can also see in the uh, definition here, this can be, for example, a name, um, any other kind of identification number or uh, location data, can be an online identifier, for example, an IP address. This is all information that points directly to one individual. So this is, these are direct identifiers. But then there are also indirect identifiers. And this is one not, when not just one information uh, relates to a person, but uh, like the pooling or the collection of a couple of information or data together, and that this then leads to the de-identification of a person. And um, it's very important um, to understand this concept because in social science data, it's, it's often very easy to spot direct identifiers, but then it's not so easy anymore to spot indirect identifiers because this can happen through uh, the pooling of information, then you have a lot of information usually collected, uh, which is concerning one individual, and then it becomes very difficult to say, is this then personal data or is it not personal data? And you need to know if you're handling personal data, because then you have a lot of different measures that you need to apply. With pseudonymized data, it's, it's basically the same. So pseudonymized data is also personal data. Um, and, also, and it, it's just that the main difference is that um, you have substituted uh, the direct identifiers, for example, with uh, the name for another name or the name for a number. And then it's, it's, not, it's still personal data, but it's pseudonymized data. So this is one way of protecting your data, but it still means that it's personal data. As long as this key that exists to connect the original name uh, with the individual exists, then it's still personal data and GDPR still applies and all the mechanisms that come with it. Um, if you have anonymous data, which means you have no direct or indirect identifiers, um, and you have no way basically of identifying this person, then it's anonymous and then it's not uh, personal data anymore and then you don't need to apply all these extra protection measures, which makes it a lot easier to handle the data. But uh, just up front, most data in social science data is personal data. So it's very rare that you really have anonymous data. So it's always better um, to think about um, in, in detail what kind of data you have. But then if you are in doubt and you, have, you are not sure if it's personal data or not personal data, to always um, implement the measures as if it was personal data, because then this data is protection. This classification that I've kind of already um, that, yeah, started to explain is, is a challenge, I would say. Um, you have here again on the slide um, the differentiation. So again, personal data, which is not pseudonymized, means that you have direct identifiers. So that is rather easy to spot. But then pseudonymized data means that you have no direct identifiers, but you also don't have indirect identifiers. What you have is just this key to connect um, the names or the original indiv individuals with, with uh, more information. And then you have anonymous data, which uh, means that you don't have any direct and indirect identifiers, but you also don't have this key. This is the main difference. And then no identification should be possible. Then it's anonymous. 
what I've also already kind of teased is the, the, the challenge or the problem in social science data is that you have a lot of data about uh, one person uh, many times. And then by this, uh, let's say, sheer volume of data, it can happen that uh, this indirect identification is possible. So this is the one issue. So for example, you have uh, survey data and then you collect uh, information on gender and age and residence and then you have information on what kind of job people have and then on the employer and if you pull all this information together then it could become more easy to identify a person even though you don't have these direct identifiers that you can spot very easily. Another challenge is that uh, sometimes you have very special characteristics of target groups where you don't need a lot of data but still it's very uh, it becomes possible or it's very easy to identify people. So this can be due to very uh, little, but very specific data. So for example, if we compare uh, two scenarios, we have um, an exchange student at the University of Vienna, and this exchange student is from France, and then this is all the uh, demographic information that we have. So we have the nationality, we have uh, the University of Vienna's affiliation, and that this person is an exchange student. So I would say that probably you cannot identify this, this person because there are multiple exchange students from France at the University of Vienna. But then if you add one more information, for example, that this person attended a seminar, a specific seminar with a name where you know that only 30 people attended, then this is specific information where all this information that I've just mentioned becomes uh, indirect identifiers that didn't, uh, and they weren't indirect identifiers before. So, it's um, a very difficult question of when anonymization or pseudonymization is reached. And in legal terms, um, it's a very absolute definition. So uh, according to the GDPR, um, anonymization is reached uh, when you have no way of identifying a person anymore, not now and not in the future. And it also specifies here, um, you can see on the slides, the definition that um, you need to consider all the means reasonably likely to be used to identify this person. And you should also take into account all objective factors such as cost um, and amount of time required for identification. So all the resources that you would need to put into uh, de-identifying a person. Um, and this is very much uh, discussed, I would say. Um, it's, it's a rather long legal discussion. Um, because this absolute interpretation does not really fit uh, the scientific practice. So from the research perspective, we would argue that there is really no way of saying to 100% that the identification is not yet possible and will never be possible. So it's rather in practice that we try to minimize the risk of disclosure as much as possible. And we always consider the potential harm to people and then set appropriate measures to say, okay, we protect this, uh, we protect the individuals that are part of, of our data. And as I said before, if uh, ever in doubt, if we have personal data, or if, even if you have sensitive, or especially when we have sensitive personal data, then we do not consider it anonymous data and rather imply more measures uh, to protect this data. The sensitivity of personal data um, is also very relevant. Um, so this is another important aspect from the GDPR and it is defined there as well. It's also called often um, not sensitive data, but special categories of personal data, but it, it means the same. And um, it's defined in Article 9 of GDPR, and you can see on the slide a couple of examples what this could be. And it's basically all data that is considered more risky or it, or it can lead to more harm when disclosure um, happens. So it can be, for example, information about sexual orientation, can be health data, um, biometric data, or data on ethnicity, but it can also be data um, on religion or religious beliefs and also political opinion. And then this again becomes relevant for social science uh, research. I have a short overview of what kind of uh, legal um, frameworks there are for you to consider. Um, and I do not want to go into detail about all of this, but this is just for me to show you that it's not only GDPR that is relevant. So it's, it's usually the term that is most common. Um, and it's, it's also 
in a way easier because it's a common framework that we have in Europe. So if we have cooperation projects, um, it is or if our data transfers to other European countries, it makes it more easy because we have this common framework. But then also this is not all that there is and that we need to uh, to look at. So there is uh, there are also national um, laws and regulations uh, for data protection that that always apply and that uh, you need to check as well. So there's the Data Protection Act. Uh, Datenschutzgesetz or for example very relevant is also the Research and Organization Act, the Forschungs- and Organisationsgesetz and there are other similar laws. So this is not um, to give an introduction to all of these but just to show that sometimes it's, it's still even difficult even though we have this common framework there are national guidelines that need to be followed that uh, differ from other um, European countries. So if you have a cooperation project with other European countries, there might be other uh, data protection laws in place that you also need to follow or you kind of need to find uh, a balance when you uh, transfer data or when you when you process data together. Um, and here maybe just something off topic, but it's also sometimes very helpful to look at institutional guidelines, uh, policies, code of conduct or any other documents like this because there can be helpful information about these aspects there. So there is uh, there can be guidelines on data protection that try to formulate from this very theoretical legal framework on how to actually manage um, uh, in research and how to deal with uh, data protection. So there is a guideline like this for the University of Vienna, for example. And there can be other information um, and use about useful services on, on data protection uh, services or templates available. So for example, you would probably often need a consent form for your research and then there are templates available that you can use. So this is a place to look for, for, for resources. And then I have another resource at the bottom of the slide, uh, which you can take a look at. So this is also from the CESTA uh, Data Management Expert Guide. And it's, it's kind of an overview over the European diversity in data protection. So it gives you some more information about other European countries what is special um, about data protection regulation, but also practice in their country can be quite useful if you are in cooperation projects. In the next part, I would like to focus on this discrepancy that I've already uh, kind of started to discuss in the beginning about open data and data protection. So on the one side, um, we need to share data openly. And on the other side, we should protect data and uh, not transfer data when we are talking about personal data or not disclose data. And often it's not uh, clear how to proceed here and how to fulfill both requirements. And there's this legal side of it. So um, I would focus on funding regulations here because this is mostly what will concern you. So you have uh, funding regulations that contractually oblige you to follow open data or fair data. We'll see that later and um, try and show a way of how to deal with that but just um, as additional information it's not just a legal discussion there are also ethical aspects to consider so there are regulations and good scientific practice that also now request uh, data sharing more and more and then demand uh, the preservation of, of data and uh, knowledge and also demand the transparency of your research process where uh, you need to make this data openly available for others to check it. So all these uh, demands also come at you from, from this legal, uh, not just from the legal, but from the ethical perspective. But I wanna focus on funding regulations because this is the part where you have this contractual obligation to follow if you have a project funded, for example, by uh, H2020 or Horizon Europe, um, or also the, the Austrian Science Fund. So there has been kind of this uh, shift from the early stage H2020 projects where uh, they started with these uh, open research data pilots. So it was kind of testing and trying out how this requirement of open research data would work, uh, but it was just a pilot. So there was no obligation uh, to follow completely. And then this later on switched to um, open research data by default as it was called in still H2020 framework programs, uh, which means that um, by default, all your uh, data should be open access. And if you 
do not want to follow or if you cannot follow then you need to explain that uh, in detail and then uh, i would say with horizon europe now there's kind of this uh, shift from open to fair data and this is what anita also said before which is a very important aspect fair data does not mean open data so data doesn't need to be completely open access uh, to be fair because uh, we realize that for social science data for example this is often just not possible and wouldn't be good so fair data means to adequately manage uh, research data uh, and this is now what is being uh, proposed in the near horizon europe framework and another positive aspect i would say is also that before you had this obligation of open access uh, which then you could not follow so you needed to opt out and then there was no or often no research data management at all but you still should manage your research data even though you don't want to publish completely open access so now you have data management according to the fair principles and also according to this principle that we also follow at Alsta and with social science data in particular which is as open as possible but as close as necessary so we always try to publish data as open as possible but if there are data protection regulations against that then of course we want to be more protective and more restrictive and this is completely in line with uh, the fair criteria and in line with the uh, funding regulations that you also need to follow so this is kind of the way of how you can bring those two together and if you look at uh, the next slide i have uh, a short uh, information from the austrian science fund because this will also be probably applicable uh, to you if, you if you have a project with the austrian science fund and i would say here that uh, the obligation is similar as in horizon europe but it, it's not quite the same so you still see here that open access for research data is mandatory um, but then again, if legal, ethical, or other reasons um, are there where, because open access then is not or only partially possible, then you must explain this in a data management plan. So kind of starting out from open, from open access uh, is mandatory, but then um, the data management plan is mandatory and open access is not mandatory if you have a valid explanation. And if you can show us in the data management plan that open access is not the best way uh, to manage your data. All right, now I want to show you a couple of aspects of how to make data sharing possible. After we've heard all these uh, challenges and uh, yeah, from GDPR, where it seems in the first place that we cannot share data, but then I would say we still can um, when you follow a couple of important steps and measures. So the three that I want to explain today are First, the consent form, um, as this is usually or is in the first uh, steps of your research process when you collect the data. Then when you curate the data, the pseudonymization, uh, another measure to protect individuals in your research data. And then at the end, just before um, archiving and publishing the data, um, choosing appropriate access conditions and uh, licenses. With the informed uh, consent, you have uh, valid legal basis for processing your data and if you deal with personal data you always need a legal basis so you can take a look at article 6 of gdpr um, you have various options um, of what a legal basis can be but they're usually not applicable for example when you want to do a survey and you need information private information from individuals so this is where you need uh, informed consent of participants to get informed consent, you need to give information to the participants about why you collect this data, what kind of data you are collecting, how this is being processed, and also what rights participants have. This is very important. And when I say how this, how your data is being processed, this is a very important part. So you need to include as much information um, as possible on what you really do with your data. So where you want to store it, where you save it, where this data then goes, if you transfer it to third parties, and then for how long this data is saved, what parties delete it, and most importantly, um, what uh, data you then want to publish, because this is, from all these stages, I would say the most risky part where disclosure can happen. There are some general principles um, of how a consent form has to look and um, what kind of 
uh, information you need to include. Uh, most importantly is to give the necessary information to allow for an informed decision making and to do this with uh, easy and understandable language. So it shouldn't be too technical. People need to understand, people who are not involved in, in research or in data management need to understand what happens to your data and then they need to uh, take a decision if they are if they agree with with what you are planning to do with the data or not. And what is almost always missing um, in those kind of content forms, and this is a aspect that we always want to point out, um, is that information on uh, data publication is almost always missing, or there's even information in a content form that negates the data publishing, which is then. Um, a problem because this is first of all the legal basis on why we are even allowed to process this data and then maybe publishes the data um, but it's also an ethical issue if you promise something to your participants that you're not going to publish the data that you're not going to transfer the data or um, that nobody outside of your research team um, has access to this data and then you do all this then this is um, not good scientific practice as well and I have a couple of examples uh, put on the next slide where um, just examples that we have collected um, from content templates. So um, on the left side, you see some uh, wordings where uh, data sharing, data archiving, data publishing is, is usually not included, which would be, for example, stating that uh, data will not be shared outside of the project team or data will not be published at all data will only be published in aggregated form, which is also not the case if you publish uh, the data set itself. And on the right side, we have a proposition of um, what kind of information should be included from our perspective, so from the archives perspective and the publishing uh, perspective. So it would be good to state that the data will be shared outside of the project, because this is then happening. Um, that the data will be published and also in what way the data will be published. And our example here is just uh, a typical example for a lot of social science data that we have, but this also needs to be adapted, of course, to your specific research project. So here it would be in a pseudonymized way uh, via our um, social science data archive. And in general, it's, it's recommended to be as specific as you can, so to give as much information to the participant for them to be able to uh, make an informed decision. But on the other hand, we would also say, please don't be too specific when it's not necessary because sometimes it's very hard to then adhere to the to those promises that you made in the content form so for example to, it, it's not necessary we would argue to include information about the concrete license for the data that you haven't uh, even gathered at this point because this is something that we also need to discuss with you as depositors in the process we take a look at the data we discuss what kind of information is there and then we uh, say okay so this license is then uh, appropriate and the same goes for access conditions so on the one side it's it's very hard to to know that up front and on the other side it's also very technical so it's often probably not necessary to inform participants about data access conditions at a repository and specific licensing because this is usually it wouldn't fall under the category of easy and understandable language because it would lead to the participant needing to research for a couple of minutes to understand uh, what this means. So we would argue that uh, this should not be included. The next step on the way to making uh, data sharing possible is the pseudonymization. Um, so I will just uh, cover a couple of um, in a couple of uh, theoretical aspects about this, but then the more practical things you will hear uh, from Anita later in the more practical session but it is uh, a central element of how we can um, share personal data but still protect uh, individuals. This is, it's not clear um, how to do this always. There are no complete rule books for all kinds of data and it depends very much on the, on the data set that you have and how much information there is and that could lead to identification. But there are, um, several ways of, of how this is usually done. So that the basics are you can delete information, um, information that is probably no longer needed or that is too detailed. And you can substitute information with a pseudonym. So this is more probably more relevant for qualitative information. For example, you have an interview transcript and then you swap the name with, with another name or a number. 
And what you can also do is aggregate uh, data. And this is more, rele more relevant for quantitative data. For example, if you have a complete uh, date, month, and year of birth, uh, it is very detailed. Um, but then you could just aggregate it, for example, to a cohort of five or 10 years of uh, year of birth. And then this would not be as identifying as, as the complete birthday. What is Sorry, important? Lisa. Yeah. Sorry. Um, just your 10 minute reminder and we have a lot of questions in the chat. Okay, um, so I will maybe skip here because Anita is covering this part. Um, then just some a little information about access restrictions. So this is also how we protect uh, data. You can be more open or you can be more restricted. This depends on how risky the data is basically. We have uh, various options at Austa as well. And we decide this together with the depositors uh, when we see the data. So do we need to be more open or do we need to be more restricted or can we be more open? Again, according to the principle, if you can be more open, then we will be. But if we see any risks, then uh, we will be more restrictive with the access condition as well. And the same goes for licenses. So um, we have different licenses. You can license your data completely open. So anybody can use the data for any purposes. But then if uh, you have personal data, um, there's this option of licensing it for scientific reuse, which is an option uh, that is mostly relevant for social science data uh, because we are still dealing with personal data. And we have a special scientific use license that also that we use for this purpose. And I have included it on the document as well. And just maybe some more information on licensing in general. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with data protection, but it's very easy to license something. So for example, you can take a look at the slides then. We have licensed them uh, open access with a CC BY, and this can be done by anybody who holds the rights. So you can just include the symbol of CC BY, or you can just write, this is a license under a CC BY license. And then this is the whole process of licensing. But what is important, you need the necessary rights. And it's sometimes very difficult to find out who has the necessary rights, um, especially at a large institution or in an international cooperation project. And now I have a couple of questions um, from DMP templates. So we have looked at various templates um, from H2020, Horizon Europe, but also the Austrian Science Fund, and they are always there are similar questions they differentiate in the wording but the main the main input uh, or the main content is the same um, i will probably not go through all the questions but i have the answers or some part of the answers on the slide so you can take a look at that later but um, maybe just starting with the first ones so it's always a question of um, whether or not you transfer your data to a repository to a trusted repository and then we get the question can you write this in the dmp that you will archive the data with us at Austa? And just a short answer, yes, you can do that, but please check with us first and discuss what kind of data you have, if this is suitable for archiving or not. And then we discuss this because it's, it's always not helpful if uh, a lot of things are promised in a DMP or in a content form, and then they cannot be upheld. So it's a good time to get in touch with us when you write the DMP and have those kind of questions. Um, then there's a question usually about if the data is safely stored in a certified repository. Again, if you uh, if you give your data to Austa and we uh, store it, then you can answer this uh, with yes, as we are certified in a discipline-specific repository, in short. Who owns the data? Um, this is a question that Anita has already uh, brought up. This is a difficult question. It's still in most DMP templates, and it, I would say it depends. Technically, ownership of data, the concept ownership is, is, is not uh, the right one um, as this is highly disputed if there is ownership of data in general it's also highly disputed if there's copyright um, of of data but what is important is um, there are usage rights to data and you need to find out who has the usage rights to data because you need that for licensing if you don't have the usage rights you theoretically legally don't have the rights to license your data then there's our questions of what legal barriers are there to make research data available. I will skip this, but um, just in general, these questions go in the same directions, but there are legal barriers. The most common legal barrier is data protection, and then we deal with it according to our standards. And uh, this is also something that can be explained very well in a DMP. Also, are there restrictions on reuse? Yes, there are. If you have a scientific use license, then this is restricted, but it's 
for a good reason, it's again for data protection. What kind of licenses will be applied? This is where I said before, it's always best not to be too specific. In the case of social science data, it's almost always not open access completely. So no CC BY, if you have personal data in there, then it's probably a scientific use license. Metadata will be published as CC0. This is important for uh, broad reuse. And this is done at Austin in the same way. It's also a typical question in a DMP template. Um, I will skip this because we have had this in a similar way. And then I've included a suggested wording for access conditions and licenses because it's always asked how will the access conditions be? How will the licenses be in your DMP? And um, here is a suggestion that you can take a look at of um, how we would phrase it. So leave it, best would be to leave it open. Um, that we will do this according to the standards of as open as possible, but as close as necessary and to our standards at the repository, depending on the sensitivity and content of your data. And now I will finish with uh, some information about, well, let's say more practical um, information about how to deal with uh, challenges. So with the data management plan, you already are planning the whole process. And this is good because some things, when it comes to data protection, cannot be done afterwards or cannot be sought retrospectively. For example, you cannot get consent by participants after you have already collected the data. This is just not valid. Uh, or you cannot get a review of the ethics committee afterwards. So this is good to think about in the DMP. And then you know you need to do this upfront. Good to know applicable guidelines on data management. So from your funders, look at the, gui uh, the guidance and regulations. Also from your institutions, is there some kind of policy on research data management? that gives you information, but also kind of gives you those additional rules to look for. And then also, please get in touch with infrastructures that you want to use. If you know you want to deposit your data at Austa, get in touch with us, and then we can discuss all these necessary steps up front, um, and this will avoid a lot of problems. And some, this is my last slide, some more practical suggestions. So um, it's always good to participate in regular data protection trainings. They have them at most uh, universities and bigger institutions. For the University of Vienna, for example, there are short trainings. I think from TIT, there are two and a half hours. Or from Human Resources Development, they're open to all researchers, to all staff. And it's, it's very helpful, even if you know, if you think you know the basic concepts, to just remember them and do this once or once a year, or once every two years to, to remember the concepts. Then if you have any questions, um, you can consult with the Data Protection Officer at your institution. Uh, for the University of Vienna, there's a ticket system that you can use. So if you're not sure how to deal with the personal data, um, and if you're not sure if, if what you're planning in your research project is legal or not, then uh, you can uh, ask for, for guidance there. And in case of possible data breaches, this is also important, uh, consult with either your DPO or another is responsible office that you have at your institution, maybe within your faculty or institute. Um, as soon as possible, because if there's a data breach, there's a certain time limit um, and there are deadlines to be met on, on what to do and who to inform. And you can get ahead of some of the problems simply by encrypting your devices. So this is very important. If you have personal data, for example, on a flash drive, then this needs to be encrypted because this is just easily lost or, or stolen. Um, it's also good to, to encrypt other devices, uh, such as your notebooks, because then for example, if you lose your notebook or if your notebook is stolen and you have personal data on there, if it was encrypted, then it is considered no longer, in, in most cases, it's considered no longer a data breach. So it's a lot uh, easier to do this and then not to, to worry the whole time. Or for example, for data transfers, you can use uh, or you should use um, secure technology. For example, please don't send personal data around via email, but uh, send it, for example, via the Akanet file center. And um, a last resource, uh, again, I uh, will point to the data management expert guide. So there's a section on uh, protection, data protection. Um, you have the link on the slide, so you can check out any more information on there. Okay, this is it from my side. And I gather that there are some questions. So, so no coffee break for anyone yet. <laughs> uh, bear with us uh, after the great input from Lisa. Okay, here we go. So welcome back to the third part of the workshop. Uh, in this third part, I will talk about the uh, OSTA deposit guidelines. You can find the link to the document here. It is available via the OSTA website. 
here you can find a screenshot of the OSTA Dataverse. So uh, in case you have not visited it before, uh, the OSTA Dataverse consists of uh, various sub dataverses like the COVID-19 Dataverse, the Ordnance Dataverse, the ISSP Dataverse, the Statistic Austria Dataverse, and so on and so forth. What does Dataverse mean? Dataverse in general is the software on which our repository relies and the software is uh, has been developed and it is maintained by the Dataverse project. It's open source, so many repositories use this kind of software. So before you publish your data, there are several steps or to put it differently, in order to publish the data at OSTA, there are several steps uh, we need to undertake together. So first of all, the first step is get in contact with us and uh, clarify the legal framework. Then the second step is signing the contract, respectively getting the signature for the contract. So please do not underestimate this step. It's very often the case that the person who has to sign the contract is the head of your department or in an international project. It can be the heads of all departments of your collaborators. So this might take a while. The third step is preparing your data for submission, then actually submitting the data. Then um, Austin will curate the data and provide you with feedback. You then can take this feedback and based on this feedback, revise and resubmit your data. So this uh, can be step five and four can be regarded more as loops than as a linear process. Then Austin makes the preservation of your data. Finally, the data is published and Austin then takes over the, all the access administrative parts. Let's start with the first step, get in contact and clarify the legal framework. So if you would like to publish your data with Auster or if you're thinking about undertaking this step, please reach out to info at Auster regarding your publication step plans, ideally as early as possible. And especially important, please let us know as soon as possible if you have any special conditions like deadlines aligned with your data and powers and so on and so forth. Then we will set up the contracts. As I've already hinted before, the contract is usually signed by the head of your department or organization. It depends on um, your organization. The contract is also a precondition for submitting the data and the contract or the signed contract is a precondition for receiving a DOI in case you would like to share one before you actually publish the data. Then the next step is preparing your data for a publication. And here two different kinds of publication material are very important for us, the documentation material and the data itself. So let's start with the preparation of the documentation material. The more documentation material is available, the bigger it is or the highest the reuse potential. So we encourage the depositors to deposit as much documentation material as possible. Documentation material is usually licensed under a CC BY license, which means that it can be easily reused by others. The description of the data documentation material can already be part of your DMP. Um, if you would like go back to the first part of the project, uh, here we have already mentioned that documentation material is an important aspect of the reusability part of your or the reusability chapter of your DMP. There are certain documentation materials that are mandatory for publication at Austin. It's mandatory to submit an instrument of data collection, for example, a questionnaire, data collection guidelines, or any other form of instrument that you used for your data collection that provides information what your data actually contain. And then the second mandatory documentation material is the metadata sheet in which the actual um, metadata are, um, are 
described, for example, the abstract of your data, whether it's numeric data, whether um, it's longitudinal data or cross-sectional data, and so on and so forth. We highly recommend you to submit a codebook and a methods report. And there are many optional documentation materials. So uh, you could also submit the project report, the DMP, interview guidelines, interview cards, documentation about incentives and contacts, recording protocols, the consent forms, or any other document that helps users to understand the data. Documentation formats are preferred to be submitted in the formats PDFA or as plain text, but we also accept all kinds of text formats like Word formats, open document formats, rich text formats, HTML files, and so on and so forth. Then let's talk about the preparation of data, which you're probably most interested in. So to start with an easy, uh, with an easy aspect, the preferred data formats. So the preferred formats that we ask you to submit your data in with us there is a Stata 14 version, an SPSS file, or a TAP or comma delimited text file, like a CSV, a TAP file, TAP separated comma files, etc. Ideally, with the common file, how this open source file can be read in into an, or imported into Stata or SPSS. Accepted formats are open document formats like ODS, Excel files, TAP or common delimited text files without common files, and um, any R data sets. What's an important precondition for submitting your data? Please, before you submit your data, check the consistency and the quality of your data. So uh, the questions you could ask yourself or checks you, you could undertake are, are the data sent and the documentation material coherent? So please check the variable names and check the value labels. Is the variable age in your data set also called age in your code book and vice versa? Do they have the same value label attached? We ask you to check for outliers for validity. So is there any person in there in your data set that is 150 years old? Please also check for the possibility of your observations. So do you have respondents who state that they are 12 years old and also state that they voted at the last national election, for example? So these are some possibility checks you could make. Or uh, if someone said that he or she is single, has never been married, but then gives information about his or her spouse. So these are examples for possibility checks. From a data protection perspective, please remove all direct identifiers. So this is a very important precondition. We cannot accept data that contain direct identifiers. What are direct identifiers? Um, any information that unambiguously identifies a person, like social security numbers, ID numbers from third parties like the Data Collection Institute, full names, full email addresses, phone numbers, postal codes, date of birth, workplace or the employee, uh, vehicle registration numbers, a bank account number, IP addresses, student ID numbers, passport identity or card numbers. So all this information definitely has to be removed for the publication of data. A next measure we undertake for ensuring data protection is checking text and string variables. So all open text fields of survey data, all raw text content, uh, all raw text that is used for content analysis and maybe part of a data set and uh, needs to be checked whether there is personal data in there. If you find any personal data, you have to remove all direct identifiers and all personal information like names. So imagine that someone says that uh, or responds to the question, what is the most important issue for you then at the next election, he or she may 
uh, state something like, well, I live in this street in Vienna and uh, my top one priority is that, I don't know, um, the opening hours at the local park are improved or whatever. So this kind of information could be identifying if uh, respondents give their addresses in open questions. And this kind of information has to be removed. If it's necessary, uh, we will ask you to sign a form that you have completed the steps and they have you checked all text information in your data files so, and that you have removed all potential direct identifiers. So, and then next important point is check your demographic variables for data protection. So please keep in mind several questions that you could ask yourself when you undertake this step. What is the universe, what, what is your universe or what is your population? If your universe is the entire population of Austria, you have a lot of large universe. If your universe is are all farmers in Burmland, the, your universe is much smaller and the risk of reidentification is much higher because there are only few people who fulfill this criteria to begin with, or there are only few people part of your universe. A second question that you can ask yourself is, what information is essential for your data? So in principle, you should not collect any data, especially not personal data, that you do not use for your research. So it's best to avoid collecting any information that's not necessary for your research. But then if you have your data set, and you have a sensitive variable in there, you could ask yourself the questions, well, do I need to keep it? Could I drop it? But of course, you have to weigh this then again against the interest of someone else who may reuse this, this information later on. So even if you do not need this variable right now, someone else may be interested in it later on. So that's a difficult decision to make here. A next question that you I should ask yourself is how many demographic variables are part of your data? So as Lisa has pointed out in her presentation, the more information is available, the higher the reidentification risk of your uh, data is of your research subjects is again. So for example, if you think back to the example with uh, farmers of Burgenland, if you also have variables like age and gender there, then maybe uh, the household size or which um, education they have completed, then the possibilities you are the categories of uh, become very narrow and it's the risk of re-identifying someone becomes higher and higher. Another way of how information can be increased is if your data is connected to someone someone else's data, like for example, for panel data. So even if your data does not contain many demographic variables, if your data can be connected to other data, then uh, the reidentification risk may, be, uh, may increase because there are demographic variables in this other data set. You should also ask yourself the question, how sensitive is my data? So is the information in, is the information in about uh, uh, religious denomination of your respondents, about political opinions, and so on and so forth? And what are the potential consequences if research subjects are re-identified? So keep in mind, for example, that political opinions in Austria may not be or such a risk as in other countries, for example, but consequences may be much more severe if you survey respondents in Russia, for example, or in other non-democratic countries. And situations in non-democratic countries may change. So these are all questions you have to keep in mind when you undertake this anonymization process. So how can you counter measure this or how can you comply with data protection regulations. So first of all, check for outliers. So outliers are 
one way how people can be re-identified. So outliers should be recorded, recorded and check for observations at the fringe of continuous variables. So for example, if you have uh, the variable household size in your data set, uh, you have many observations for household sizes between one and seven, and then only very few for eight, nine, and 10. So one possibility is to recode uh, this variable to the category seven and more. The same applies to age, for example, above a certain threshold, and it's always an empirical question. You can uh, record your data to, for example, 70 and older or 85 and older if your observations become, or number of your observations per year become smaller and smaller. Um, Anita, we have a question in the chat about outliers. I think it was more um, around the consistency and quality uh, slide, but as they popped up right now, okay. I just wanted to ask quickly. Um, so would, what's your recommendation for outlier, outliers or unplausible data? Uh, exclude these cases from the data set? Uh, well, it depends if it's clearly not plausible. I would first of all recheck. Maybe there is some data entry error somewhere. And then if you have someone in this data set that is really not plausible, my personal preference would be to set this, uh, set these observations to missing, for example provided that all other observations for this person are valid. So maybe it's just a typo or someone wanted to type, I'm 15 and then in the end, he or she typed, I'm 150. So this could be one way to proceed. If uh, you have doubt of the, about the entire observation for this person, you could also drop this case. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's go on. I check for demographic variables. Um, another recommendation is checked for indirect identifiers in fine-grained categories. So um, I've already mentioned the uh, example of postal codes. Uh, postal codes can be very fine-grained. So you need to check categories, whether they, they provide such very fine-grained distinct um, yeah, very distinguished to such a fine grained level between respondents. And we also recommend to check for low number of observations per category. Our rule of thumb is that we recode or that we recommend recoding observations if there are less than 20 observations per category. So for example, if um, you ask for the religious denominations of respondents, um, there are all, some religious minorities that usually only have very few observations in a survey. And so we recommend that these very few observations are recorded to larger categories, for example, um, another to category, other uh, residual category. Or if you have uh, your country of origins for parents or other relatives, you could uh, aggregate this information to broader categories. So instead of giving the specific country of origin of a mother, for example, you could use the continent or another geographic um, entity. So what are examples of recoding data? Examples are, or how you could recode data for age, you could, uh, recode your data to cohorts if there are less than 20 observations per age group. For the education, we recommend using ISCAD levels, ISCAD categories on level two, because others are too fine-grained. For the ISCAD codes, it's level three, and for the NATS codes, it's level three also. So this is the minimum level we accept for publication at Alsa, because especially for the ISCAD codes, there are some occupations that are so, there are so few people work in there that if it's too detailed and for me, if it, this category is too detailed, the re-identification risk increases very rapidly, very quickly. So 
uh, religious denomination is another variable that uh, should be recoded to proto categories or the other if there are less than 20 observations. I've already mentioned this example. Household size, number of children um, is an, another example for recoding to higher values, e.g. to five and more or whatever is appropriate to your, for your data. For ethnic groups, country of origins or first languages, we recommend aggregating observations to higher geographic levels if there are less than 20 observations for your category. The checks and qualitative data are essentially the same in many respects. So the principles remain identical. You have to remove all direct identifiers. You have to check the entire content and you have to check for indirect identifiers. But the procedure differs, of course. So uh, the checks that I've mentioned before are designed for quantitative data. This means that um, it's often not or we recommend recoding the data, and I've talked a lot about recommending uh, recoding the data. But uh, for qualitative data, the approach is of, of course differently. So you may you may use pseudonyms for your research subjects. You have a text documents that you go through, and you do not type two lines of data code to recode your data. As for technical requirements for um, depositing your data. We ask you do not to use system missings in your data, uh, especially if or recommend that you use, for example, negative codes, because it's easier to convert these negative codes and it's easier to convert these negative codes to other proprietary um, software like SPSS and Stata. And we ask you not to use variable labels longer than 78 characters. So how to prepare your data. So during this whole preparation process of your data, we ask you to document the changes in your documentation material so that um, users who reuse your data know exactly what kind of uh, data protection measures were undertaken. And please reach out to us if you have any questions. Finally, uh, once you are satisfied with all the data protection measures and all the data decoration process and the documentation material you have prepared. You can submit your data by using a secure way of sending the data and we recommend the Aconet file sender as a secure way to transmit your data. What do we do then at Auster? We check your data, we give feedback, you then incorporate this feedback or say well no I have a very good reason why I do not want to follow this or that re recommendation. Then we recheck your revised data and we add archive variables like the version and the DUI. Then data comes to the preservation cluster, which means that all data files are converted and published in three formats and the OSTA staff uh, under undertakes these processes for you. So we publish all data in Stata, SPSS and CSV file and we convert your documentation material to the PDFA and also make a machine readable variable, variable identifier file, which is basically a code book for your data set, but it's machine readable and thus can be reused for a very long time. So I've reached the end of my presentation for now. What's up to come next? So in the next session, um, I will present some data code that proved useful for preparing your data and for data checks. If you would like not to participate, please still uh, take some minutes uh, for the evaluation of the workshop in general. Else, uh, yeah, you have also the possibility to evaluate the workshop at the end of the data sessions. Are there any questions at this point? Right now. There's nothing in the chat, so um, there was this one question. Okay, then I would say let's move to Stater and if you'd like to participate um, before we start,
please be aware that the default template contains commands that prove useful for data checks, but this by no means indicates that all necessary checks are part of the template. And the automated data checks are designed to help you check your data also for data protection regulations, but they do not replace going through all the variables and checking all variables for potential data protection violations. So it's please consider it as an additional tool, but it's only one of the tools that you need for making your data compliant to data protection violations. The link for downloading the templates is in the chat. Maybe Veronica, yeah, probably already have posted it. So how to start? Please download the template, unzip the templates, copy the templates and your data to one folder if you would like to use it. Open the do file 0.1 tablet workshop dot du and at the correct path to your working directory in line 84 and the name of your data file without the file indication DDA in line 49. I will do the same and give you two minutes and hopefully everyone is ready. Can you see my screen, including just uh, the the data code? Uh, um, I still see the presentation before okay. we start. <laughs> Thanks. You. And now I can see a state output and uh, a do file window. Okay, perfect. Um, does anyone need two additional minutes? Nope. So then let's start. So we only have 15 minutes left. So I will go through the code quite quickly and if you have any questions we can either stay longer or uh, yeah you can then write me an email and we clarify any questions about the do file later on so if you have not already installed the following packages we recommend installing these so you definitely need them if you would like to run the entire do file but they are very useful for working yeah for data correct um, the decoration in general. So oh, wrong template. So here with this cable uh, macros you can set a global indicator or uh, yeah, a global macro to your working space and to your data file so you need not repeat this step later on. As a test data set I've taken a manifesto data set, the Otmas manifesto data set of 2017. So what do we do here? Change to the working directory, check for the SATA version of the data file we use right now. So we see here that it's a version either 15, uh, 14 up to 17, which is includes our preferred version of 14. So we leave it here. And then we say, let's open the data set. If you would like, you can use a log file to document your all the data checks you've made and all the 
all the preparations you've made. So what I always start with is just a brief description of what data do I indeed have. We see it's indeed the oddness analysis of, con of Altness content analysis of party manifestos 2017 with 18 variables and more than 25,000 observations. What we recommend you check before submitting the data is whether there are any nodes attached to your data set. It's often the case that there are internal nodes attached to the data set like who uh, made what preparations and so on and so forth. So before publications, we recommend that you delete all internal notes that you would not like others to see. Duplicates report. Duplicates report is a um, very useful command to see whether you have any duplic yeah, duplicates in your observations. Then the, it's good practice to include an ID variable in your data set. Uh, you can check for ID variables with the com command is ID. Here we get an error message in this case. So I try it again with two variables. And if I use two variables, I can uniquely identify the observations, which is fine. So we can move on. Scan data and a label is a useful command for scanning your data for unlabeled values. So with uh, these three lines of code, uh, we recommend that you uh, let them run all in one. And here you then see whether or not your data contains unlabeled values. In this case, yes, uh, because there's a number of variables that has a range from minus one to nine, including uh, negative uh, decimal numbers and positive decimal numbers, such a cannot cannot label decimal numbers. So um, it's inconvenient, but it's fine to have these unlabeled values in the data set. Next, we can check for system missing. So if there are any system missings in the data file, um, just to let you know, the system missing dot is OK for data. Uh, we can easily convert this to SPSS, but uh, all other system missings like .a, .b, .c, and so on and so forth uh, cannot be converted to SPSS. So they then are then all collapsed to one and the same value. So if you would like to have different missings in your data sets, we recommend that you recode them to, for example, negative values. We can let this loop run we get no hint. So this means that there are no system missings in this data set beyond the usual dot, which is OK. Here, I do not uh, run this loop. This loop simply means list the frequencies of all variables in the data file. Since we have more than 25,000 observations, this would take a while. But this is nevertheless a very important step. So that's uh, one thing we always do uh, during the data correlation process, go through each and every variable and see what's actually the content of this variable. Here you can find code for identifying spelling errors, for example. So if you use the common use label, data generates a code book basically of your data. So um, you can have a quick look here. Here you then have an overview of all the label name, the values and the labels attached to this specific value label. For example, the actor predicate minus one means rejection, actor predicate zero means neutral, and so on and so forth. So you basically get a code book using this command. Then you can use a string function to trim your labels and see if there is anything, if there are any leading or trading planks or any embedded planks in your code, it's a polycosmetic 
measurement, but well, if data does it automatically for you, why not use it? With this kind of code, with this line of code, you can already generate this data out, this data code, how you could remove the string. And if you see, if you check again, you can see here that we did find one observation that had embedded blanks in there. And we could copy paste this line of code, which is now, which is now truncated. But if um, I enlarge on the screen, I could see the entire line of code and I could copy paste this code here or below to remove the leading or embedded blanks from the code. We do not need this anymore. Okay, if you would like to check your data for any special characters, you could run these lines of code, then you see if there are any special characters in your text variables. And as you can see here, there are many of them, but since we use Unicode, these usually do not cause any problems. If you encounter any hearts in here or any emojis, they may cause some problems. So it's always good to check if there are any special characters involved. You also, of course, can extend this and these lines of code with any special characters you would like to remove that are not displaced here then. And then if you, you could uh, run this kind of code and export your code book to an Excel file, you should, if you let this run, you should then have an Excel file that you can use for a spell check. So here your codebook is exported to Excel, um, which is also the already the code for Excel and for Stata in there. So the idea is here that this is your original label. You can real. This is your. This is um, again the label, but this time, the spell check version of it. So you, if you detect a typo somewhere here, you could change it. For example, say, well, I really would like to have a blank space here. So, you then get automatically the information that uh, you will made some corrections here, and you can copy paste this code to Stata and run this code and you can then automatically correct the label you've made with this version, so with the blank embedded here, which is very convenient if you spell check many, many different observations here. So you can mark this and then say, I would like to perform a spell check here. You can use the automatic version in of Excel and then simply copy paste the information that is necessary for you. So let's get back to the data sets. So here are some useful um, lines of code for anonymization checks. As I've mentioned during the presentations, you need to check all string variables. And this is a very useful comment for identifying string variables. If you run these lines of code, you automatically get the output which string variables are detected by uh, by data in your data set. So the version is a string variable, the UI is a string variable, which is not surprising. There is the verb sentence and statements and page number and title of the manifesto. So these are all string variables in this data set. Uh, if you detect string variables like, um, I don't know, a room, responses to what's the most important 
problem the country faces right now. Uh, this would be one example that uh, of a variable that you definitely need to check for submitting. In this next block of code, uh, this next plot of code is designed to help you identify variables that are ID variables that have less than 20 observations per category and to identify string variables. So how does this work uh, for these variables or for the number of observations per category that we consider problematic, in our case 20, you can define a global threshold here. So our global threshold is 20 and then you can run this line of code and then you get again some data code. Nothing to restore here because I forgot to include the preserve comment here. Nevertheless, you get an output in an Excel file again that lists all the potentially problematic observations in your data set. As I've said before, this code is conceptualized as an additional tool for you to help you identify potential problematic variables, but this by no means replaces that you go through all the observations, or all that you go through all the variables one by one. So here you can have a list of the problems and it were found. So we have identified several print variables. We have identified several variables that have low observations. Here you see the variable name and the variable label. And then you can go through each and every of these hits and see whether you would like to drop this variable, whether you would like to recode this variable, or whether you would like to leave it unchanged. And you have also the possibility to comment on your decision. Okay. Since I forgot to use the preserve comment, I have to reload the data set. Here is the place or place dedicated for conducting possibility checks. Um, if you would like to, you can rerun uh, the code on the special characters or for identifying special characters again for or string variables. So in the first time we have run this, we run this code on value labels. Here you could run it again on special characters for string variables. And that's the end of the two file. So this was a very quick tour through all potential data curation checks you could make, which proved useful for the decoration processes at Alster. Do you have any questions?